Hello and welcome to the Aylesbury History Festival. Uh, my name is Martin Brown and I'm the illustrator of the Horrible Histories books. Um, you may have seen them around. And history can be pretty horrible. Uh, I guess you're all familiar with the First World War. I mean, that must have been pretty horrible. The, the bombs, the bullets, the poison gas. The barbed wire, the mud, the stink. Can you imagine all that? All that grimness, all the horribleness. The machine guns, the bombs, the bullets, all that. The trenches and lice as well. I'm not talking happy little head lice. We all get those from time to time. I'm talking body lice. The ones that live in your clothes and come out and suck your blood and spread disease. You get them if you can't wash. If you can't change your clothes. And of course, down in the trenches, you couldn't just pop off to the showers when you felt like it. Sorry, Sarge, I'll, I'll be right back. I'm just going to have a shower. No, you have to stay there ready, prepared for an, uh, preparing for an attack or maybe to receive an attack. You might have been in your uniform for days or weeks. And if you couldn't wash and you couldn't change, you got lice. On average, a British soldier had something like 20 lice on him. You, you couldn't avoid it. But if that was the average, what do you suppose the record was? Because one day, a group of mates sat around in a circle and they counted every single louse they found in one of their friends' uniform. If the average was 20, what, what, what could it be? Could it be as much as uh, 50 or 100? You know, five times more? Could be more than that, 500, 1,000 even. I mean, we start getting into numbers that are hard to picture. I mean, a classroom is about 30 kids. That's 30, 2,000, but 1,000. Well, luckily, I have come prepared. That is 1,000. Do you think one person could have 1,000 lice on them? It's hard to believe. It's hard to believe. Hard to even think about. Or, or more possibly, I mean, could a person have 2,000 lice on them? That many little things crawling around in your clothes. Or 4,000? I mean, surely not. And the average was 20, yeah? Okay. What about 8,000? 8, 8,000 lice. Could one... Uh, this is... Um, probably getting into the realms of fantasy now. If the average was 20, could one person have 8,000 lice on them? Well, I suppose I should put you out of misery. When counted, it was discovered that this soldier, the British soldier on the Western Front, in the trenches, had in fact 10,000 428 lice in his shirt. They didn't count the lice they found in his trousers or his jacket or his socks or his underwear. 10,428 lice in his shirt. I think you will all agree with me that that is indeed some <laughs> dreadfully horrible history. But there's history for you. It's full of all sorts of horrible stuff. And of course, it can be quite local as well. You don't have to travel miles away to, to find just some disgustingness. Um, take your famous Aylesbury Duck. I mean, you're all familiar with that. It's the emblem of the town. Beautiful creature. And quite an industry, especially in the 19th century. But did you know that one duck can poo up to about, or just, just short of a hundred times a day? One day, one duck. Times that by all the hundreds and hundreds of ducks that were part of the duck rearing industry in Aylesbury in the mid 19th century, and that's a a lot of poo um, every day <clears throat> and of course that poop didn't stay on the ground just where the ducks pooped it 
as late as 1892, that poop was one of the contamin contaminants found uh, in the drinking water of the people of Ashton Clinton, um, along with slaughterhouse and farmhouse and kitchen runoff. Hmm, lovely. I'm horrible indeed. Um, and, I've got, <laughs> and I've got to illustrate all that horribleness. I mean, it's a fun job most of the time. Uh, but I am a writer as well, um, and I've written a couple of books about much nicer things. Um, animals, in fact. Uh, no ducks, sadly. Uh, but I wanted to write about some mammals. Mammals that most people had not heard of. Um, so that's these books, Lesser Spotted Animals. Um, Lesser Spotted Animals too. Um, do you like animals? You know, most people say they do. But do you know a lot about them? Um, I might just test you for a minute and see what you really do know about these wonderful creatures. Um, <coughs> bit of a test. Here we go. First one. What's that? Come on, easy one to start off with. Well done, yes, elephant. If there are any grown-ups in the room, of course, you've got to shout out the answers as well. Otherwise, we'll just assume you don't know. Right, um, okay, another one. What's that? Yep, tiger, well done. Panda, excellent, yes. Good, good, good. How about that one? Ah, not so sure, huh? It's not a squirrel, not a raccoon. That is a numbat. It's a wonderful creature. It's a marsupial anteater. It's only about the size of a small cat or a large guinea pig. It's got a long fluffy tail. You can't quite see it. A bit like a squirrel. But it's more closely related to kangaroos than squirrels. Uh, and it's a gorgeous thing. Look at it. It's much nicer than a meerkat. Meerkats are all over the place. Uh, but this guy... There's only about a thousand of them left in the wild. Now everyone's heard of pandas. Panda, panda, panda. Pandas in the zoos, panda babies. It's all we hear about. But there's only about, um, well, there's a thousand of them. There's about 3,000 pandas. But how can we only ever hear about them and not him? Or what's that? Isn't that amazing? Yes, it's a dolphin. Well done. Um, but what kind? Have you seen anything like that before? What an extraordinary looking creature. It's called a southern right whale dolphin. And when I first saw this picture or a picture like it, I, I kind of thought, oh my goodness, how could something like this be in the world and us not know about it? It's just so amazing looking. It's one of the most striking creatures I have ever seen. How could this be out there and us not know? Or what about that? You know what that is? Not a buffalo, not a bison, not an ox, not a yak. It's a it's a bull, but what kind? That, ladies and gentlemen, is a gower. Have you ever heard of a gower? If not, I'm amazed because this is the biggest bully, cowy, cattly thing in the world. It is the biggest of them all. It's bigger than a bison, it's bulkier than a buffalo. It can be three meters long, and two meters tall, and weigh a thousand kilograms. And if that's hard to picture, a thousand kilograms, imagine a whole class of ten-year-olds. Thirty ten-year-olds stood together before social distancing. One classroom of 10 year olds weighs as much as one fully grown cow. It is a colossal animal. Its moo can be heard a mile away. But how can we always hear about bisons and buffaloes and lions and tigers and polar bears and pandas and all the other standard celebrity A-list animals we always see? It's kind of like there's nothing else. Well, I think it's because most books have only got those animals in them. Everyone wants to see the famous ones. But isn't it time that we told the stories of some of the other creatures out there? That's what these books are about. 
brilliant beasts you never knew you needed to know about. Because it's important to learn about the lions and tigers and pandas and polar bears. But not just them. I mean, there's 5,000, maybe 5,500 different species of mammal out there. If we counted up all the other mammals that we could think of, that we can remember, we'd probably only get to about 30. And only then they'd be the famous ones. Well, what about the others? And there's another reason as well. If I said to you, the koala is going extinct. Can you imagine a world with no wild koalas in it? Would you want to live in such a world? I don't. I, I, I think it'd be horrible. If these guys were going extinct, would you sign a petition to save them? Would you raise money? Would you campaign to save the last koalas left on Earth? It's so cute and grey and cuddly. I'm sure we would. But what about the black-footed ferret? Huh? Would you raise money for that? Would you campaign? Would you sign a petition? Well, it's hard to do that if you don't even know what it is. And I think it would be a real pity if this little guy wasn't around. And you know what? He very nearly wasn't. In the 1970s, everyone thought they were extinct. They used to be out on the prairies and in the in America and the Great Plains and uh, they were got rid of. The farmers didn't want them. They used to eat things called prairie dogs and the prairie dogs made a mess of the, of the pasture so they were got rid of. And of course the things that ate the prairie dogs they died out as well. So no one thought they were around anymore until one day in 1982 a farm dog called Shep came home to a farm outside this tiny little town called Matsitsi in Wyoming with an animal in its mouth. And it was a black-footed ferret. It, it was a dead black-footed ferret, but still, it was, it was a black-footed ferret. And the farmer, he scratched his head. He hadn't seen one before. So he took it down into town, gave, gave it to the uh, taxidermists. And luckily for us, the taxidermists recognised it and thought, oh my gosh, this... Can it? Surely not. And he, luckily he took some photographs of it and sent it to the scientists. And they went, oh my God, it's a black foot ferret. It's good. It's a black foot ferret. And sure enough, they rushed to the town and started, the place was swimming with scientists. Uh, all over the prairies around the city, covered in scientists. And they found a colony. The only colony, a colony that they thought didn't exist. 200 in this sort of huge family grouping. But the tragedy was, as soon as they found it, they realised that something was wrong. They were getting sick. They were coming down with this uh, thing like a canine distemper, the same sort of disease that our dogs get. And it was killing off the very creatures they had just discovered or rediscovered. So they had to do something. They took a few healthy specimens, uh, healthy animals away to separate them from the sick creatures. We know something about that, of course, these days. Um, it's just in time because the disease wiped out the entire colony. In the end, there were just those 18 black-footed ferrets left. Seven females. That's all there were in the whole world. First they were extinct, then they were rediscovered again, and then just about extinct again. But with a lot of love and some careful uh, breeding, those 18 became 30, became 50, became 100. And soon there are enough black-footed ferrets uh, to put some black-footed ferret families back out into the prairies where they belonged. Now there's sort of somewhere between 500 and 1,000 black-footed ferrets living in the wild. But it wasn't that close. It was that close before we lost them completely. And until that time, hardly anyone had ever heard of them. They were a thing of the past. So if you're famous and everyone knows about you, that's great. But if no one knows about you, then it can be pretty tragic. So the idea of this book really is to tell some of those stories so that, I don't know, we might 
learn a little bit more about few, a few of the other animals. But it's not just about endangered things. Some animals are worth knowing about just because they look amazing. Um, there's this fabulous couple of things. Forest buffalo and the red river hog. <coughs> They're not rare in the slightest. But look at those ears. They've got fabulous flappers. They're both sort of red and black and white. And they both live in sort of um, damp bits of Central Africa. But those ears, they are just fabulous. Who wouldn't want to know about creatures like that? And, and maybe you're not even good looking. Maybe you're a sort of dull little brown thing. But even those creatures have got stories to tell. But especially if you've got a great name. Um, I'll just read something from the first book to give you an idea of the sort of thing I'm on about. This one is the dagger-toothed flower bat. Let's face it, apart from the fact that this is one of those animals that no one's ever heard of, the main, the main reason that this bat is in this book is because of its name. The dagger-toothed flower bat. What a great combination of words. Flowers and teeth and bats and daggers. It conjures up an image which would make a fine tattoo for some bike again tough guy. Or a blazer badge for a vampire school. Trouble is, dagger tooth flower bats are fairly gentle creatures, not at all violent or bloody. They're just plain little brown things. And rather than having a taste for danger, they have a taste for the sweeter thing. They flap and flit from flower to flower in a warm tropical evening, sipping at the honey-like nectar they find in each beautiful blossom. Hardly the stuff of muscled heavies or nibbled necks at midnight. In fact, all that flower visiting is truly beneficial. As they move about the trees, they spread the pollen that sticks to their faces. Without this pollination, some fruit trees would be fruitless. So here's to the dagger-toothed flower bat, peaceful pollinator and banana hero. And you probably can't see, but there I've, I've, I've drawn him as a, as a banana hero. There's a, a banana superhero, um, probably a bit too small. I, I can fix that. Hang on. Here he is. Banana man, banana bat, banana bat man, banana man bat. Banana, banana. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, because he's a hero. He's like, you know, without bats, there'd be no wild bananas. So it's a, you know, he's a bit of a dude. Uh, now, I could have done this book, or these books, with photographs. I mean, clearly, you know, these wonderful things are kind of worth seeing in any format. But... The trouble with photographs is that they're real, <laughs> and um, in real life, uh, bats don't dress up as superheroes. So the only way to have a bat dressed up as a superhero is to draw it, which, which is great. Which is what I do. I mean, I'm 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 called a cartoonist, but really this is a cartoon. Uh, I'm called an illustrator, but uh, with cartoons you can do so much more. So it's not supposed to be realistic. I suppose I should talk about drawing now a, a bit. Um, you know, I'm an illustrator of the horrible histories, I'm a writer and illustrator of lesser spotted animals. And people have got some very strange ideas about illustrating, or about drawing, about art. Uh, people say things like, well, why can't draw? Which is clearly rubbish. And of course, everyone can draw. It's like sort of walking and talking. There are a few people who can't, but most of us can. Uh, what you mean when you say you can't draw is you don't like what you draw, or you draw a picture of a, a horse or a face or something that doesn't look realistic. So you say, I can't draw. But who says drawing has to be realistic? I don't draw realistically. I'm a cartoonist. This is not a realistic picture. Um, realistically, animals don't talk. So I've got this sort of problem with trying to make... I mean, see, if you want to draw realistically, you can. You can learn how. There are books. 
no one's born able to play the trumpet or the guitar. You have to learn. And it's exactly the same for drawing. But the point is, everyone can still draw. That's drawing. Now, I know you can do that. Okay, everyone can do this. And don't let anyone say this isn't drawing, because otherwise I'm not... That's because this is what I do. But if you can do that, then chances are... You can do that. And if you can do that, then chances are... You can do that. And if you can do that, chances are... You can... do something like that. You see, it's all drawing. This is all drawing. If you can do this, you can do that. If you can do that, you can do that. If you can do that, you can do that. It ain't magic. Now, I draw like this. A lot of people do. Uh, in fact, most children's books or, uh, or uh, illustrators don't draw realistically. Some of the most successful illustrators in the world don't draw realistically. And no one says they can't draw. What's that big brown thing? You're good at guessing before. Do you know what that is? Yes, it's a horse. Of course it is. Is that a, a good picture of a horse? Well, it's, it's not realistic. But it's certainly good. This is by Axel Scheffler, you know, one of the most extraordinary and one of the most successful illustrators on the planet. He's the guy behind the Gruffalo, for goodness sake. It's a wonderful picture. It's not realistic. Well, hopefully it's not realistic. But what's that thing on the back? I think it's the rat, highway rat. But I'm fairly sure rats aren't this big and don't carry weapons. And I'm also fairly sure that squirrels uh, haven't got bow ties and bush wheelbarrows. So it's not a realistic picture, but it is a superb picture. And what, are you saying this guy can't draw? What about this? This is joyous. I have a poster of this um, by Helen Stevens. It's sort of, it's, it's almost quite, it's not simple, but it looks simple. It's just a bit of blue to throw the colour out. A lot of yellow here, but quite similar yellow, a bit of sh shading there. Some red to catch the eye. This lovely little smile is circled in white, which focuses on it. The brown's all the same, just sort of like all the brown's the same. And the line work is just scribble, really. But it's joyous, isn't it? It just makes me smile to look at it. And it's not remotely realistic, but it is wonderful. Um, well, how about this? What on earth is that big blue thing? Well, of course, it's a shark. Uh, Sarah McIntyre's wonderful shark in the bath. Uh, once again, it's just a perfect example of how wonderful and joyous and fun illustration and drawing can be. Not remotely realistic. Moustache on shark. Fairly sure that's not a thing. Um, but isn't it great? Don't you just want to read and find out what happens? Isn't it just, you know, this is what drawing can be. You can learn how to draw a horse that looks exactly like a horse or a face that looks exactly like a or ha uh, face if you want to. You can learn how. There are books. But you don't have to. You can have fun. You can have fun drawing.
Um, I should do some. I should do some more, shouldn't I? Having uh, talking about it so much. Um, right. I should draw something from lesser spot animals, I guess. I'll. I tell you what. You could draw along. Um, if you have to pause this and then run and get some paper, or maybe you've got some handy. Oh wait. Right. Um, now, I start all my drawings with a pencil. Now you don't have to do the same thing. Um, this is just the way I draw. Everybody has a different method of drawing. No two illustrators and artists are the same. This is just the way I do it. I like to work out everything first in pencil, and then I'll go over it with ink. So just because the pencil won't show up, I'll use this orange as, as pencil. The advantage for me is that I can then change it as I go along. If, some, if I think something's in the wrong place, not that there's such a thing as right and wrong, the drawing can be very flexible. But if I want a certain thing in a certain place, of course I can change it with, a, with its pencil. And I'm going to start with some basic shapes. Because when you're drawing animals, you, it's good to just look at them and kind of see what shape they make or the shape that underlies their form, what shape the animal is. You'll find that most animals are beans or sausages. You know, start with a sausage, you know, that's most of a wolf, for example. Uh, right, so here's a bean, okay, sort of slightly fatter at one end. And then here I'll draw a circle, sort of half off, half on the bean, and then I'll draw a little cone attached sort of up from that point where the circle meets the bean down to there, then back up again, sort of a slightly curvy. And then I'll do some legs at the front and some legs at the back. And a long tail. It's quite long and so it disappears a bit. Uh, it has got more feet, but this I'm drawing this slightly from above, so that the, just to make things a little bit easier, the feet are tucked away behind. If you can't see it, you don't have to draw it. It's great. You know, if you're drawing someone's face, you don't have to draw the back of their head. It's good, that. Uh, a little ear there, a little ear here that you sort of almost don't see because it's kind of around the corner. Eye is there. So that's my basic shape. Now, I haven't told you what it is. You might have to guess that later. Uh, now, I've got my basic shapes there, and I could just join up some of those, those lines to make it all one shape. Now, for the tricky bit. Well, I say tricky. I'm scribbling. It's got a lot of shaggy and almost spiky hair. It's got a pale patch of hair on its shoulder for some reason. It's got lots of hair. There. Well, it starts to get slightly bald down its face. So by the time you get to the end of its nose, Ford has a long whiskers. It's kind of got hair like that. So that's it really, that's my pencil. You know, I might thin down that leg slightly if I was being picky, but I, that'll do. So now what do I do after over that? Because this is, I'm happy with that. So I go to finish artwork now. And I draw over it basically, drawing it twice, once with pencil, once with ink. But I'm, I know where everything's going, so I can, I can do the ink now. Right. Do that shaggy coat, little ears, another ear there, almost lost, nose. I'm going quite quickly, a, a drawing like this might take me a, an hour or so sometimes, so this is pretty quick for me. So a bit pale a bit there. And then dark legs. A 
long tail again that too is quite dark a bit darker on the neck, a bit more hair on the head your ears and there we are what do you think that is any ideas it's not a rat it's not a possum uh, it's not a hedgehog uh, if you have drawn that along with me that's quite a realistic picture actually for all you people who said you couldn't draw that's quite a realistic picture of the Cuban Selenodon a Cuban Selenodon or Selenodon I've heard both um, it's a wonderful little creature quite rare um, it's one of the few mammals with a poisonous bite it has poisonous saliva which runs into the bite uh, through little grooves on its teeth the problem is it's not immune from its own poison bit of a problem really so if it got into a fight with another Cuban Selimodon um, hmm, not such a good idea but there you are you can draw Cuban Selenodons um, and he features in my um, first book because he's such a wonderful creature um, well, there's a groovy little tooth it's a it's a book full of these wonderful and curious and lovely things um, and the more we know about these animals the more perhaps we can do something about saving them especially guys like this the thing that you have just drawn that is quite rare and if not careful it will be gone forever so ladies and gentlemen that's that's how i draw that's how i draw animals that's how i draw well horrible histories is pretty much faces with hats kind of look um, a feather from an Aylesbury duck um, ladies and gentlemen thank you so much uh, thank you for joining me thanks for watching check out all the other stuff that's on offer during the Aylesbury History Festival uh, online and I very much look forward to seeing you in person one day. But in the meantime, get drawing. Thank you very, very much.